everybody, it's Dina Blizzard, and it is time for Sip, Share, Advocate. Tonight we are talking all about uh, vision, uh, vision related or learning, learning related vision problems. Did I say it right? You got it. All right, and so joining us tonight, you're gonna love him. His name is Dr. Galloway, and he is a pediatric optometrist, and uh, is talking all about vision therapy and learning-related vision problems tonight. So, and he's associate professor at Salis University in Philadelphia. So let us welcome Dr. Michael Galloway. Come on over, Dr. Galloway. Well, I thank fixed you, it, Dana. So you didn't see the little black dot the whole show. This is Dr. Galloway, everybody. I told him we were going to be really cozy tonight for the show. Um, so um, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background first, and then we'll go to the, your sure. fun details. My, uh, um, I've been practicing uh, pediatric optometry for a number of years. I have a private practice in New Jersey, uh, Marlton, New Jersey, not far from Dina's here. Mm -hmm. It only took me 10 minutes to get here there without traffic. There you go. That's a good show. It was great. Um, I'm a longtime optometric educator, meaning that I have been teaching at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, which uh, became Salus University a few years ago. It's this healthcare university okay. in Philly. And that's been my passion uh, for many years, working with uh, young optometry students, teaching them about kids' vision. Uh, Did you bring any of your stuff with you? My gizmos? Yeah, your little <laughs> prisms and stuff. <laughs> Because you did, got a lot. I did not bring my gizmo. Next time. Right, Next time. Right. You'll we'll have do to that. imagine it. Most people have been to the eye doctors, but they're, you know, we, we have kind of fun little yeah, you games have fancy and stuff. tools that uh, typical eye exams. All right. Erica says have. you have to speak louder. Okay. Ooh. Oh, there we go. See? They speak get, up. There it is. How's that? There it is. is. That better? All right. So you're a very fancy doctor. That's what we've gotten. So tell us, I, all of our doctors have to come in with three interesting facts about themselves that are not about your educational pursuits. So tell everybody your first one. This one I heard already. Well, I have a uh, um, mostly under the radar career as a singer songwriter for many years. And uh, my brother uh, lives in Nashville and about 25 years ago we said, uh, we can write songs as good as that, what you hear on the radio. Duh. Can we write? What's yeah. the How hard is that? How hard is it? <laughs> so we wrote some songs and we got them published but nobody ever cut them. We got some demos <laughs> made, and uh, you know, so you, can, you go to, you go can to, you go hear them anywhere? They're like on iTunes or oh, anything? In my uh, living room. In you your know, living room, that's, about that's it. interesting. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I have music buddies that I play with, and occasionally we play. Oh, are you play a musician? Out in public. Yeah, yeah. What do you What do you play? Guitar. Okay. Guitar. Not and guitar, because that's how they say it. In guitar. Guitar. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is. Um, I'm a longtime hockey player. But you have all your teeth. I do have. Oh, these are a couple over here. Are Thank they? You, so. Really? They look good. But how about this? All I right. I was out skating on a pond in Collingswood on Saturday. Okay. And nobody else was on this pond. And that was your first clue. And uh, mm -hmm. after about 20 minutes, no. I noticed three guys walking over to me with uniforms on and started raising their voice and saying, what are you doing? You shouldn't be skating on this pond. Can't you see that red flag that's sitting up in the in this post that was like forty feet above the ground? And then I heard the sirens, and a, a two cop cars came and a fire truck, and six guys yanked me off the ice. You're in, lying. In this little pond in Collinswood, which is can't be more than three feet deep. And did you say I'm an optometrist? I said, come on. <laughs> and they started telling me that there were, you know, some dogs had gotten uh, stranded on the ice and they had to rescue them. And I said, you know, but I'm not a dog. I'm not a dog. I've been skating for like 45 me. years on ponds. This You could you could have the whole marching so band of Collingswood High School on this pond and it wouldn't break. Because it's 50 degrees now, but you're saying on Saturday? On Saturday, it would, the, the ice was really thick. But anyway, so that was... Uh, do you have ice skates, or you're just like out there with your feet? <laughs> of course, I have ice. Skates. Oh, I don't. Yeah. Know. I don't know what you do in your free time. No, I'm a longtime hockey player. So that, really? that's really another. So they didn't bit. arrest you. No, they. Uh, they I, gave I, you a stern talking I, to. Right, I I tried to be, uh, you know, gently shame them, embarrass them, and think, you know, <laughs> what are you doing, kicking this old guy off off the ice? I that's mean, what you should do with the cops. Gently shame them. <laughs> 
<laughs> there we go. Yeah. That's how we're going to start the then show. Then I thank them for their public service, and we moved. Well, that's we, a good idea. We moved to on. roll into the thank you right. for on. saving your life, exactly. which didn't happen. It was, it was like this close. So uh, this close, close to, going to under. death, and they saved you. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, so we have a little background on you, so that's good. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. Tonight we are talking about uh, the types of vision problems affecting kids in the classroom. So we're going to start there. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the behavior signs of vision problems. Um, you know, I think that besides eyesight, what are the things, you know, a kid saying, hey, it's hard for me to read, but what are they doing behaviorally that we should be looking for? And um, how do vision problems affect reading and learning in the long run and what we can do to help that? So, um, so let's start off with the big question. What types of vision problems besides like, hey, they're not 2020 vision? Like what are some right. things that we should be aware of? So a little known fact is that half of the circuits in our brain Mm -hmm. serve our visual system in one form or another. 50% of the neurons in your brain serve your visual system. So the idea that if a kid's vision is Mm 20-20 is literally the tip of the iceberg in terms of informing you as a parent, as a teacher, about what that kid's vision is like. Uh, my office is filled with kids with 2020 vision who have a variety a of visual problems that really? are affecting reading, learning, sports, yet they can see the tiny letters on the visual acuity chart. The school nurses said they're fine. The pediatrician for a number of years. I was going to say, I feel fine. like that's how most parents will, will find out there's a vision problem. It's just because they'll do the regular little vision tests that they're physical. Right. right. But you're saying that most of the kids that you see have perfect vision, but they have these other issues. So what other issues are, are, are in general? So are you when you think about what happens in a classroom, of course, you want kids to be able to see the smart board, see the blackboard. So they do need, you, you want them to have 20-20 vision. Uh, to do that, but that test or having 20-20 vision does absolutely nothing to predict how they use their eyes when they're looking at things up close. So when you read, your eyes have to cross in towards your nose. That's called convergence. Like that? Yep, just like that, exactly. <laughs> but it not doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like that in real Teachers life. Teachers and parents, if you see your kid doing <laughs> Don't that. Don't do that. That's yeah, right. not a good sign. You're, you're in trouble. So it converges, and that's how, that's it how the kids get one kid, image, that's, right? That's how they get one image. That's how kids get single vision. Then there's a focusing muscle inside your eye, which tightens to allow things to be clear. And that's what you must lose sometime around the age of 46. Bingo. Because that's why everything <laughs> is this far away. Is that right. that's what exactly happens? Right. Why is it like that? It was literally overnight. Why does does that muscle just get weak? It's just actually like I'm out. It's actually retires? the lens inside your eye, which the muscle controls, loses flexibility. Gradually as we Like go. overnight? Because it literally you, you just felt like it was overnight, but you were nice. losing it gradually before that, and then you just kind of fell over that little cliff. It was awful. Yeah, it, I can't. It, it, it's it's just, uh, it literally, you have to like take it farther three, away. Three certainties in life, death, taxes, and bifocals. And, this, and you, okay. you hit number. There you go. <laughs> you, you, death and fine, taxes, taxes two yeah, out of three. Right, right. All right, so convergence. So, convergence, which is eye teaming ability. That. Focusing ability okay. and tracking. Uh, tracking is a child's ability to either follow a moving target, which they do on the ball field, okay. or to quickly jump from word to word as they're reading or scanning. So copying from the board, reading a book, so scanning reading a them in an order. Right. Tracking is a developed fine motor skill. And kids with tracking problems will lose their place when they read. <clears throat> They'll omit and substitute words. They'll read slowly. Their is, reading fluency is often impaired. Is that a for where does dyslexia fall? Is it a deficiency in tracking or well, is it having, it, how does that fit? I and, feel like that's the most common one that most people know, right? Right. People have, everybody's heard about dyslexia. Many people think that dyslexia is seeing things backwards. And as your yeah. previous guest, Dr. Selsey, yes, talked so this about. Yes, book right here. Yep, uh-huh. yep. The core deficit in dyslexia is generally difficulty sounding out words and remembering words. I mean, those, those are the two key pieces. The biggest is often sounding out words. Interestingly, kids who are dyslexic are at higher risk for having tracking problems, but tracking is not the main reason why they're having re- uh, reading difficulties. Yeah, I mean, I guess I... F- it's separate. I feel like overlaps- dyslexia, I think most people think it's just switching letters, but you're saying it's... No, the big, the big issue in, with dyslexia is, is uh, attaching sounds to letters and blending them into words. 
Hmm. Phonemic awareness. Um, That's phonics. our first big word of the night. Yeah. You yeah. just heard it. Yep. All right. So, um, so that category of, of issues. Okay. Eye teaming, focusing, and tracking. Those are the issues that can make reading and desk work a lot more challenging for kids. And guess what? Kids in the classroom spend way more time looking at their desk or going back and forth from the desk to the right. board. Roughly two thirds of their day is spent looking at their desk or computers, screens. And kids with tracking, teaming, focusing problems are much more likely to have issues, symptoms, uh, signs during those activities that, that make them harder. So it's not like your kid's going to say, I'm having trouble seeing the board. That's, it's more that they're sitting at their desk and they can't keep up with what they're reading in their hands. Bingo. Right. So how do you catch that? How, how, how is so, there something that parents like, all right, if you talk about tracking, so just a little background on how I met Dr. Galloway. So uh, many people know that, you know, we're kind of on this journey with, uh, with our kids and trying to figure things out. And we actually, we're going to talk about vision therapy in a little bit, but we went through this whole process with Dr. Galloway and, um, and the amount of tests that you do and all your gadgets is extraordinary. Um, but teaming was one of them, kind of that for, you know, forming one image was mm -hmm. an issue. Um, she just said, you describe my entire ICS classroom. That's what Patty just said, with, with what you just said. Um, I wonder what ICS stands for. Inclusion, maybe? Hmm. Tell us, Patty, what yeah, she tell that's, us. Yeah, good. So, um, so, all right, so based on those three things that you've said, is it, um, what, are, what, is, what are the vision problems that's going to affect how, how does reading? it show up? Right. Right. So... The way it shows up support. In most... In class support, that's what it means. In class support. Yes. Right. I see, yes. So kids with IEPs, kids with learning challenges, uh, learning disabilities, uh, plenty of research has shown that those kids are at higher risk for these types of vision issues. Add vision processing problems to the list as well. And the reason is, is because kids with learning challenges often have parts of their brain that are not quite as robust or as uh, in sync with other parts of their brain. Mm -hmm. And we talked before about our, our brains being 50% uh, uh, visual. Uh, so it's, it's likely that when kids have um, <clears throat> any type issue. of learning issues that uh -huh. they're, they're going to be at higher risk for vision issues as well. So, um, so we're talking about Dr. Galloway, who is a pediatric optometrist, um, and we're talking about um, learning-related vision issues. Um, do us a favor, if you're watching and you're enjoying the show, uh, share this video, tag somebody that you may know that has a child with any of these issues. Uh, like I said, this is our first, fourth episode, and we're trying to kind of get the message out there and to have Dr. Galloway with us um, is wonderful. If you have a question, you can always send us a question as well. Um, Somebody had just asked a question. Oh, here it is. Maria says, and this kind of going into our next one, does it ever show up as ADHD? So like, what are the behavioral signs? Like right, so here, here's, here's how parents and teachers get clues about um, visual function. Um, these are not kids that love to read. In fact, they generally hate to read. They avoid reading. They can't read, sustain reading for any period of time. And homework is generally a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I think you've described so many kids. Right, right, well, right. And, and the uh, the ADHD connection. There's uh, been uh, a number of studies that show that kids with ADHD diagnoses are at higher risk for having vision problems. Uh, the most common eye muscle issue, eye teaming issue, is called convergence insufficiency, difficulty keeping your eyes crossed enough to read comfortably. Kids with ADHD we're three times as likely to have convergence problems really? as the typical population. And then a separate group of kids with convergence insufficiency were three times as likely to have a diagnosis of ADHD. So, so do you the follow, symptoms overlap. So do you find though that like if you have a child that has gotten an ADHD diagnosis, do you feel like they're then being told in some type of consultation, hey, you should go and look at vision as well, or is this just for people to just kind of figure out because you've just said well, it on the internet? In my perfect world, uh, any kid with an attention problem should get this type of vision uh, examination that we're talking about, and any mm -hmm. kid with a reading problem. Mm -hmm. These are relatively easy visual problems to fix, mm -hmm. to identify and then fix. So if we can make it easier for kids to pay attention, and the, the answer is when kids have these types of vision problems, 
almost invariably, they have difficulty sustaining attention during reading. They don't like to read. They can't read for any period of time without getting symptoms of headaches, eye strain, blurry vision, words moving on the page. What kid is going to want to read for any length of time if after two minutes the words start moving Just, around on the page and their eyes hurt? Do you feel like kids are able to adequately or at all explain um, what's going on, right? Like, so right. if they're, do you find that kids are able to, to tell you, like, I can see it, it, or are they saying it just doesn't make sense to me, or are they so, saying that the words are moving, like? Right, so age 10, roughly, nine to 10 is the cutoff. Below that age, all bets are off. Like, they can't explain they it. They can't explain it. You they know, just, they are just not, rolling around the floor and they don't right, want to participate. They, they go off task, they avoid, they appear inattentive, they cannot, they don't have the life experience, the language skills, uh, to express what they're seeing. So below age 10, we have to look for behaviors, what I call behavioral signs. My website has a nice little list of behavioral signs. Uh, parents and teachers can take the vision quiz and, and see how often uh, kids exhibit these signs, but they are things like rubs their eyes when they read, holds reading material close to their face the longer they read, loses their place when they read, squints, blinks, uh, turns their head when they read, use their finger when they read, even though they know all the words. So those are all behaviors that uh, a teacher or a, an observant parent can pick up in just observing their kid using their eyes, which is during reading and homework. But, you know, the things that you just described, though, wouldn't necessarily be things. Like, if some kid's just doing that with their eyes, I would just think they're tired. And that's no big deal if it's 8.30 at night. But if that's uh, 10.30 and, and, and it's in the middle of the school day or if it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon and the kid is fatigued, is rubbing their eyes after three to five minutes of reading, that's a big deal. It's normal at 8. Right, at, at a certain time, right. right. But, but these kids will exhibit these behaviors much more rapidly earlier in the day and much more frequently than kids typically do. Yeah, the kids uh, hold things close when they read. Yeah, every kid, the kids slump down, have weird pauses. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's no big deal. If it's after a half an hour, of right? If work, it's five minutes, then then you're uh, you're wondering what what's going on with with my child. You know, d did they not get enough sleep last night? Right. Why, why is this so hard? So when reading and homework seem so hard, I mean, there's really three choices: attentional skill, right? Visual skill, right? And skill with the activity that they're doing, whether it's reading, math, writing, etc. So the content based it's, issue, yeah, content based issue. So. All of those things need to be looked at, checked off, uh -huh. when kids are struggling to uh, do the activity, whether it's do a half an hour of homework in, in a half an hour, which should take a half an hour at home, yeah. or get through their, their classroom work in a reasonable amount of time without the teacher having to send it all home. So if you're just joining us, we're being joined tonight live by Dr. Galloway. He is a pediatric optometrist, and the uh, website he was referring to is his website, drgalloway.com. And so tell everybody, if you were to go to drgalloway.com, there's a, some type of vision quiz? Yeah, there's a little... Uh, oh, and there's a link in our post as nice. well. And, and it's, you, you just read through the behaviors, and you, you, you check off as to how often it happens, and then you can... Uh, uh, a score above a certain level is a high suspicion that uh, uh, the child in question is uh, uh, likely to have vision issues that are interfering with their reading and learning. And um, I had asked Dr. Selznick this last week, and I and I, I had asked Riza the week before, who was speech and language, are you finding that kids that are having these issues are getting diagnosed early, or like? Are you seeing children older who have been able to compensate for things like this? And you know, where, when, and where? Obviously, as soon as possible. But when, when is the, the, um, you know, these therapies the most successful to be kind of integrated? So that, yeah, that's a good question, and, and it's it really speaks to the need for your show, really. And <laughs> that's why we're here. And and the, the idea of a child study team. Learning is multifactorial. Learning issues are, mul your, your brains are multifactorial. The, the, the notion that um, you know, every kid should be detected by first grade or fifth grade or whatever, uh, it, it's challenging because kids bring a whole range of different strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. to the table. Mm -hmm. Would it be a, a good idea for every kid to have this kind of eye exam in first grade? Yeah, but maybe that's co that's probably cost prohibitive. Yeah. Should every kid with a reading problem have this kind of exam by second grade? 
yeah, I'd sign that legislation in a heartbeat. Are you but... finding that that's happening though? Or are you getting more kids in like upper elementary or even high school coming to you that were never diagnosed? It happens in kids that are smart enough to slip through the cracks mm -hmm. in the early grades and they have a higher verbal IQ, their basic reading skills are good, but by the time they're in sixth grade, somebody notices that, you know, their standardized test scores are starting to slip. Mm -hmm. They avoid reading, they can't, they hate English class. They've ne they end up, they never finish the book. They, they, they want to do audio books because they can't read uh, for sustained periods of time to finish their assignments. So yeah, there's a, there's a group of kids that slip through the crack the cracks and get picked up later, the younger kids often appear as if they're inattentive and people are thinking, does this kid have ADHD? Yeah, you know, and it's funny what you said earlier because I don't think that, you know, if you get a diagnosis of ADHD, I don't think that any parent is like, well, first thing we have to do is get an eye test. That is not at all. The first thing I'm like, oh, we need some medicine. You need to go sit down. Like, you're just, right, um, right. So how, how come these things are not talked about together how and i get referrals from pediatricians from neurologists who think exactly that though they and mm -hmm. it's so it's it's growing awareness it's not growing as fast as i would like and some other people but uh there is growing awareness that when kids get a diagnosis of adhd you need to rule out vision problems auditory problems uh, nutritional problems that that all can contribute to uh emotional problems uh, other than ADHD, anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps that can contribute to inattention. Uh, it's, I think, a little problematic that we rush to medicate right. kids. And, and, and does not do all the tests. Right, does medication help a lot of kids? Yes, is yeah. it overprescribed? Yes. yes. Yeah, I remember, you know, you were just kind of one spoke of our wheel, our pediatrician, Dr. Um, Dr. Rosen was wonderful. And she said, I think, that your daughter has ADD, right. but I will not give you the diagnosis until you do all the tests. And somebody actually wrote in here as well, the hearing test was part of it. That was mm -hmm. also very important. Yep. We did vision, we did the vision therapy, we did anxiety, we did everything. Um, and then when everything was on the table, then you could kind of start to piece this story right. together. Right. And that's what a progressive physician does. I, I know Dr. Rosen and, and she's been, she's known about these issues for mm -hmm. a long time and she practices accordingly. Yeah, uh, she's we, great. We, we need more of that. So um, one of the <clears throat> things that you just said, you just said a lot of stuff, but there was another question I wanted to ask you. I can't remember what it is. It's going to come to me and then I'll interrupt you. Okay. All right. So behavioral signs you said are going to be like the, the eyes bringing the books closer. So, um, you know, we kind of touched on how these vision problems affect learning and reading. Um, you know, what, what do they come out as, right? So I know for Brooke, it was her ability, the teaming was an issue. So she could tell me, I remember very specifically saying to you, I'm at home with her and we're studying for the spelling test and she can spell every word when you ask her. And yet she'll go and take the spelling test and she'll fail it. And, and it was this teaming issue. Um, you know, it, is it just that kids are failing tests? Are they, are they getting put into slower reading groups? Um, what does well, it look like? Like, what are the things? Oh, wait, I know what I was gonna ask you, hold on. So you're a pediatric optometrist. Right. Are, when I take, when it was time to take my kids to the eye doctor, I just took them to my eye doctor who right. just does the, hey, there's an E, read the next line. Right, right. Are they screening for all the things that you're saying? Some of them are, and some of them do not. Uh, and that is tricky for parents uh, who are trying to negotiate this maze. Uh, some parents think if their kid had a screening at the pediatrician, that must mean everything is fine. We need to totally debunk, debunk that. Uh, but say they go to... But if they go to a, you know, a... a another, you know, an eye care professional. Right. Um, my office is filled with kids who are receiving vision therapy right now who have been told that their eyes are fine by another eye doctor. So the eye doctor has to test eye teaming, tracking, focusing. And do most of them do that? No. Because I was going to say, I don't remember, because it's funny because we've gone to you a couple of times and I've said, hey, it's 2020. And you're like, that's nice. Let me do some other tests. Right. And I was like, what right. else are we going to do? And then right. he brings all the prisms and stuff out. It's great. Right. Um, so how does a, 
if someone's watching and says, okay, listen, you've basically described my kid. Um, I want to take this next step. And I think that this might be part of our problem before they make an appointment with an optometrist, do they call and say, Hey, I want to know if you're going to check for eye to So that's one thing that they can do. You can, they can advocate a little bit. Uh, if it's a practice that sees a lot of kids, that's a good sign. Okay. See the trouble with, with, if an adult has this type of problem, and adults have these problems too, an adult will go in and say, you know, I see double vision, I get double vision when I read, I can't read for more than five minutes mm-hmm. and I get a headache. And, and, and so the, the doctor is cued into, well, I've got to do some tests to investigate that. If it's an eight year old kid, they're gonna come There's in no and story, not gonna say right? any of that yeah. stuff. And mm-hmm. so they have to be skilled at pulling the behaviors out of the child or, or the parent or the teacher and combining that with their test to see if the child has a vision issue. So one way is to see if it's a kid-friendly practice. The other way is to, uh, there's a website um, of optometrists that specialize in children's vision and vision therapy, which is the treatment modality that we uh, often use to to fix these problems. It is called covd.org, College of Optometrists and Vision Development.org. And there's a doctor finder in there. You plug in your town, your website, and COVD is uh, an organization of, of board certified optometrists in vision therapy. So you can find anywhere in the country, you can find optometrists that specialize in this. So COVD.org. Perfect. Is that yep, it? So yep, Meg, if you can it. post that, COVD.org. And that's that's really the safest way. Every, is, that, is that a popular, I, I mean, other than you, I don't know anybody that's doing that. Is it popular? Yeah, there's probably, it's it's not as popular as it uh, could be. As or, it sounds. Or should be. Uh, sounds because so. it, there's lots of, lots of kids that have these issues. Um, but it is gaining in popularity. In the Philadelphia region, for instance, there's probably, uh, I'd say, 12 to 15 doctors who have vision therapy as part of their practice. And some of them, vision therapy is, is the bulk of their practice. Yeah. So it's a specialty. It's become a specialty area within optometry. And even some ophthalmologists are starting to recognize the value of vision therapy. I get referrals now from, from ophthalmologists who mm-hmm. are medical doctors who... Uh, do surgical residencies oh, gotcha. and they're, they're surgical specialists, but they also do regular eye exams and there's pediatric ophthalmologists uh, that see children and uh, uh, you can't fix every vision problem with eye, with uh, surgery or, yeah. or glasses. All right, so that's gonna be our next question, but Meg, can you fix that post? There's a question mark and a slash at the end of it. You just gotta fix that. Um, so a couple of people while you were talking um, have asked about it, so I just wanna bring it up. It, they keep asking, they said, is this a good fix for monocular vision? What is that? And monocular you- vision uh, means that someone's using one eye uh, presumably because there's something wrong with the other eye. You mean like without knowing it, like yeah, just kind of so, leaning on? Well, it's you're, what happens is, uh, it, this is a, uh, the, the topic is amblyopia, which is lazy eye, which is monocular vision loss, one eye or the other, because a child has a crossed eye, a lazy eye, or a different prescription in that eye. So hmm. when, they, when that's present early in life, um, kids will lose vision in that eye and then they go to take the the uh the test in the pediatrician's office or the school nurse's office and they can't see out of one eye hmm. uh, is that fixable can you it is, is fixable. that kind of what vision yep. therapy is so let's move to that yep. right yep the, the interest the thing about amblyopia is that everybody agrees that it's treatable we understand it screenings can find it uh we know it's important to find um the it does not affect reading and learning however so it's hmm. it's generally it's 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 obviously something that you want to detect and and fix, but there's there's wide agreement on that. There's much less agreement on the um, other I, you the know, I teaming focusing right. and tracking issues, and and because there's less agreement on that, it's less commonly tested for hmm. in everyday eye examinations, right. whether it's optometry or ophthalmology. Interesting. All right, so let's talk about vision therapy. So if somebody is having problems with teaming, having problems with what are the other two again? Focusing, focusing, and tracking, and tracking. Um, one of the uh, therapies you offer is vision therapy. So tell everybody about that. Right. So vision therapy uh, is <clears throat> it exists because we glasses. There's lots of uh, eye muscle issues uh, that you can't fix with glasses or surgery. Convergence problems you can't fix with glasses or uh, or surgery. So 
It's the recognition that these visual skills are eye brain skills and if you set up the right conditions, which is what vision therapy does, it's basically rehabbing the your, muscle. your visual brain. And we, you, you can think of it, you can call it eye exercises, but the eye muscles, there's six muscles that surround each eye. Your eye muscles don't really look any different after vision therapy, but your brain does. The latest studies show that kids' brains and adults' brains who've had vision therapy actually change because these are motor skills that we're training. So uh, when I think motor skills, I'm like, these right. are motor skills, and you're saying, essentially, you're moving these muscles, right? Your, your eyes are moving when you're tracking, your eyes are moving when you're converging, when you're focusing. So these are, these are what are called the motor aspects of vision, and vision therapy is... Uh, very effective at improving the uh, these aspects of vision. Now, Maria just asked, my son is 16, is it too late for him to receive therapy as it relates to school and academics? Definitely not. Uh, I do vision therapy on uh, high school, college kids. Uh, I see lots of adults who've had concussions uh, that have uh, caused uh, issues with these visual problems. Uh, um, I see uh, 70 and 80 year olds who develop double vision for a variety of reasons and vision therapy can uh, can help uh, throughout our lifespan. And the reason is, is that your brain never stops being able to learn something. Uh, I mean, certain neurological problems can be permanent, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, the garden variety eye muscle issues uh, and, and the solution for that, vision therapy, um, or one of the solutions for that, the, the um, the window is open throughout our lives. Well, someone just asked, is five years old too young? Is there a too young? It depends on the type of problem and the capabilities of the child. Um, vision therapy does require the child to tell you what they're seeing. There's, we use instruments, uh, 3D instruments, uh, lenses, prisms, but kids have to tell us when they see double, when something disappears, when things are blurry, uh, what that shape is. So. Kids have to communicate, although in some cases we can work with younger kids doing a little bit less sophisticated vision therapy. Um, <clears throat> we can make uh, kids toys as young as you know two and a half or three into vision therapy activities with 3D glasses. But it's most, it gets more effective between five and six and beyond that uh, it can be uh, very effective for a variety of issues. But it's not a panacea, there's plenty of things that it can't fix too. Somebody just asked, what's the difference between vision therapy and what a vision in itinerant inter what is that word itinerant itinerant, itinerant. 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 that's okay. what i was about Great. to say so a vision itinerant is my sense we we don't use that language uh in new jersey but i'll bet it's called i never a, use that a, language a, uh, i have no idea what it even means what low, is that a low vision educator or a low vision teacher and th these if, if i'm understanding this correctly it's it's an educator who is skilled in making accommodations for kids with more serious visual impairments, which is often called uh, low vision. You know, kids who have 2200 visual acuity, kids who have, uh, you know, need uh, visual aids to... Uh, so you're talking about somebody who's not necessarily a doctor, uh, working with kids in a school as like an aide. Yep, yep. They're not going to do optometric vision therapy. They're going to help kids use... How software to, program like how occupational to, things right like how bet. to how yes. to compensate in in everyday life perfect got you all right um there was something you were just oh so just uh so just to clarify vision therapy uh and, and what it looks like it's all it was only like what 45 minutes to an hour a couple a couple weeks in a row or was it a couple of days well a week? The, the typical uh vision therapy cases with eye teaming and focusing tracking issues take between three to five months uh, in my office where I see kids either once or twice a week and then I give exercises, activities for the parents to do at home. So it takes a little bit of time. It's not years and years uh, uh, of, of work, uh, but it's not two weeks of work either. Mm -hmm. it, uh, think about how long it takes your brain to really learn a skill. Yeah. If you're learning how to keyboard, you know, that's gonna take you uh, probably six months to a year to really have it become automatic. Right. If you're learning how to play the piano, play chords on a, on a guitar, it takes longer. Fortunately, vision therapy doesn't take as long as that, but it takes some time. And the key is it has, these visual skills have to become automatic. You don't want, you don't want kids to have to think, think about, about what it, they're right. doing. You want them to read and pay attention uh, 
to the material, not have to pay attention to what their eyes are doing. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we are getting towards the end of the show. Today, uh, we were joined by Dr. Galloway. Is there anything else you want to kind of give people, um, you know, in terms of advice if they have a child that's kind of somewhere along this journey? I think the, uh, think about uh, the visual capabilities of, of your child. Do they like to read and can they read for sustained periods of time? Those, those are the biggest clues that a, a child may be visually inefficient. Uh, don't take the advice that, oh, your kid has 20-20 vision and, health, and healthy eyes doesn't need glasses and that they're, they're and fine. That's the, they're, that's the end. It's not the end. My office is filled with kids and every, every vision therapy optometrist's office are filled with kids who've been told that their vision is fine and, and then when they uh, see the right person and these problems are discovered, it can make a world of difference in their ability to read and, and succeed in school. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd say uh, look at the list of behaviors. Uh, you know, my website, there's many other websites uh, out there that, that do a good job of this and get a, a consultation with somebody who understands this. Mm -hmm. uh, typically a uh, specialty uh, uh, optometrist, a vision therapy trained optometrist uh, to do this and, and some ophthalmologists uh, are able to or you know choose to to look at this area as well. Um, one interesting thing to think about is uh, for parents to understand <clears throat> how these issues can affect their kids is think about what it's like to read when you're tired. And if it's 1030 at night and you're reading something maybe for work the yeah. next day or even I can't even concentrate. I'm like, I don't, I read right. the same thing three times. Right. I don't know what it's saying. Exactly. And what's happening there is you're using some of your attention span to stay awake and attention is limited. We have this much attention. There we go. That much attention. And if you're using some of it to stay awake, you have less of it left over to comprehend what you're reading. Reading comprehension takes all of our attention. It involves six different parts of our brain that are having to function simultaneously to understand, uh, to read and process the, uh, the language, remember it. So it's normal if your child is, is exhibiting those behaviors 10 minutes before bedtime, but it's not normal. If it's four in the it's, afternoon. It's 10, 30 in the morning. And kids with vision problems, this is how they act when they are asked to read for sustained periods of time. It's like you reading, parents reading when they're tired. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. forget what they're reading. They'll reread. They just can't get it into their brain and well enough to retain it. Mm -hmm. So these are kids that don't complete their work in a timely basis in the classroom. They're kids that uh, are slow, choppy readers and have difficulty with reading comprehension. Once those visual roadblocks are eliminated, uh, <clears throat> the uh, the reading process can often uh, flow a lot more smoothly and uh, with a lot better stamina. So one of the things, and I know someone had mentioned it uh, in the promo that we'd actually done last week with Dr. Selznick, we were talking about, you know, how when you go and you will get a diagnosis and then you bring that to the table and, you know, how helpful is that at an IEP meeting to get you the services that you need. I know that when we were able to add some of these issues to Brooke's story, um, that she she was able to kind of get other accommodations. I think it told a little bit more of the story. Are you finding that, you know, parents are able to kind of use the information they're getting from you uh, to effectively get help in classrooms? Sometimes it can be helpful. Uh, I think from a point of view of helping the, the child's teachers understand why the child is exhibiting these behaviors in the classroom, mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, an understanding teacher who can say to a child, you know, if, if things get blurry or double, let's just take a little break right. and, and can do that quietly and not make a big fuss about it can be really stress reducing for kids. But I've also had parents tell me that when they bring one of my reports into an IEP meeting um, that the, the some schools will say, oh, well, that's the problem. And let's just wait until that's dealt with. Mm -hmm. And then we'll think about Re, uh, reading tutoring or uh, occupational therapy or some some sort of school-based intervention and I think the um, that's dangerous and and because if, if your child has a number of issues on the table you want to be looking at as all many of as yeah, all of them exactly. as many as possible and it's not doesn't mean you can remediate them all at the same time but yeah. you can't it's it's not that easy to predict uh, ahead of time uh, which 
uh, deficit you need to go after first. But if it's reading and the kid can't read uh, well, that to was, a level, that they, yeah. they, they need intervention. And that was the biggest issue for us is that, you know, we kept her in these on-level classes and I was like, but she's not, un she's, not un she's not getting in. The information's not getting in. And so it really, the information we were able to get from you really helped us to say, I want a reading specialist. I want somebody right. that understands how to work with her and understands that it doesn't matter if you keep reading it over and over again if she's, if she, if they're not, her eyes are not teaming together and um, so it just you know I think that a lot of what I learned from you and that whole process was that yeah there were these multiple layers and going back to Dr. Rosen our pediatrician who was kind of like looking at this whole story um, she kept saying I think that you're looking for one name for this Dina and I think you actually have a number of things going on with right. your daughter and you're looking for a pill and she's like here's your pill and that's it and I was like that's exactly what I'm looking for and you keep adding little sprinkles and stuff and it's just it does and for us it was trying to figure out which one of these is the issues that were happening were having the greatest impact and and trying to deal with that one first, because if I could get that one dealt with, then the other ones could start to be a little bit more clear. Um, and that, right. that was well, hard. Well, I'm, I'm glad I was able to help with that a little bit. I mean, most optometrists who do this kind of work will do a reading screening and look for non-visually based pieces or factors that are affecting reading. And, and if it's not visual, say, or if it's partially visual, say, okay, we need to press this button here. Phonics is an issue. Uh, ret word retrieval is an issue. Uh, yeah. Let's let's look at these other areas. So it it really does take a team approach. Vision specialists realize that we're one piece of the puzzle, and mm -hmm. sometimes with some kids, we're no piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. We rule the, the visual problems are ruled out, and sometimes it's it's a very big piece. But yeah. it's a puzzle, and unfortunately, that means different professions are involved. Mm -hmm. It's why it's called a child study team, uh, and it's it's it's. Uh, it, it can be daunting, uh, indeed, for parents, but it's uh, it's the only way to figure this out uh, when kids are, are, are struggling. Yeah. Uh, we have to check off the, the various boxes, and, and, and vision problems uh, are one of the, the, uh, the boxes that needs to be looked at. Well, thank you. Dr. Galloway, let's hear it for Dr. Thanks Galloway for tonight, doing a great job. So uh, do yourself a favor, check out drgalloway.com, check out that vision test if you have a kid at home, maybe this sounds like them, um, and see what you get. You can always contact him through his website. Also that covd.com, so if you are, org. .org, thank you. If you are not local to the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, um, check it out, find a vision therapist in your area. Um, if you're just joining us now, we talked tonight with Dr. Galloway, a pediatric optometrist, all about learning related vision issues. Um, and uh, go back and you can watch this. Do us a favor as well and please share this um, in your feed. Share it with people that you know need to hear this. I, like you had said, I think ADD is, uh, is very popular. Everybody's talking about it, but I don't know that they're talking about the connection um, between that attention and whether it's is that behavior indicative of maybe perhaps other visual issues that are going on? So, um, so thank you guys so much for uh, joining us for our fourth episode of SimShare Advocate. Thank you again, Dr. Galloway. Thank you. Um, next week, next month, um, we're going to be talking it's legal issues, yeah. right? So we have a great expert joining us talking all about this is the transition into college, or no, this, no, this is, is IEP. Um, yeah, like so, advocating. So Boy, next month, you don't want to miss uh, our March episode. We'll be giving you some um, promotions, telling you all about it, but all about advocating and IEPs and things that we need to be remembering. Um, you know, the end of the year uh, meetings will be coming up in April, so we wanted to give you the information that you'll need going into those. So, um, so thanks, as always, for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you again, Dr. Galloway, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a good night.